This episode of The Minimalists is brought to you by your local blockbuster video store. Wait, 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 wait. We got a sponsor for the show finally? No, I'm just kidding, man. This episode and all of our episodes are 100% advertisement free. Oh, good. Enjoy the show. Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing that's just feeding your greed Oh, I bet that you'll be fine without it Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Minimalists Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. I'm Joshua Fields Milburn. And I'm Ryan Nicodemus, and together we are The Minimalists. Yes, we are. This episode is episode number three, and today we're going to chat about children. Ryan, what what did you do last weekend? Man, I had an awesome weekend. I went to the Hot Springs... Where to uh, Jerry Johnson and to Weir? It was it was awesome. There were no kids there. It was all adults <laughs> <laughs> bathing in the hot springs. Uh, it was pretty relaxing. What about you? That's awesome, man. I was uh, chasing Ella around trying to convince her to put her diaper back on. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have thought that you have to deal with a small child before I did? Uh, not me. Um, <laughs> No, I. Uh, for those of you who, who don't know, Ryan is certainly privy. I, I accidentally became a, a parent by proxy last year. Um, uh, my partner Becca Bex, she has a two and a half year old daughter Ella, and so I am learning a ton these days about managing children, and uh, that's really what what today's episode is going to be about. And we're going to start with. Um, what, some voicemails? Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, let, let's do that. We have a couple voicemails. This first one is from Don. Hi, guys. My name is Don, and I am from Columbus, Ohio. Um, my question, which I'm sure tons of parents have all over the world, is how do you battle the clutter that comes with kids? I have two small kids. They're five and one. I have a wonderful family who I love dearly. But when it comes to holidays or even non-holidays, the gift giving is out of control. Our bookshelves are stocked full. Our toy boxes are overflowing. Our basement is full. Our house looks like a Toys R Us from wall to wall. And I have guilt about giving up things that don't belong to me or things that have just recently been given to them as a gift. Um, I feel kind of mean, I guess you would say, if I try to dictate the things that people give um, or if I return things. So I guess I'm just trying to figure out how you deal with third-party clutter, things that don't belong to you, things that people are kind of inflicting on you, so to speak, and what your solution would be to that. And this next voicemail is from Stephen. Hi, guys. Thanks for doing the show. Your episodes have been great so far. Here's a question for you. As I'm trying to have a minimal life and with a family, and especially with a child, um, where in the society these days, um, kids have everything. They have absolutely everything, and even stuff that they don't even need but they feel that they need it. So do you have any tips on helping your kids um, also take on a minimal life as well? Thank you, Stephen. And we have a similar question also from a Don. This one's a different Don on Twitter. Yes, Don Miller writes at The Minimalists, I'm trying to declutter with small children. Need helpful info for the influx of crap kids bring on. Hashtag Ask the Minimalists. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we have have three similar questions here, I think, Ryan. And um, we can start with the the first one with with Don's. Yeah, Don. She she brought up... Voicemail Don. Yes, the voicemail Don. Not Not, not Twitter Don. Not Twitter Don. This is voicemail Don. No, I I think Don... uh, what What stood out to me in her question was how does she get rid of these gifts. And she specifically said 
that she didn't want to uh, get rid of anything. She didn't want to give away anything because she felt very guilty or she felt like she was being mean. And, and Don, I would love for you to read uh, an essay that we wrote that gives you permission to let go of those gifts. So Don, if you go to our website, theminimalists.com forward slash gifts, you will find an essay titled there, Letting Go of Physical Gifts. And you know, another thing too that might help this situation, not just finding a way to get rid of the gifts, but finding a way to proactively uh, get rid of gifts coming into your home, meaning instead of waiting until December 26th and regretting all of these presents that you're getting and being angry at your friends and family for gifting all your children these gifts, start the conversation now. Start it right now in January and talk about how you don't want to bring those things into your house and then reiterate that uh, through through conversation, through your actions, through example throughout the year. Yeah, I think what Ryan's talking about is uh, you're basically talking about setting expectations, right? And, yeah. And... and we, we need to do that beforehand. Uh, what's the saying? You want to kill Godzilla uh, when he's a baby or as an egg. Yeah. Don't wait till Godzilla is taking over the city. And I think that that applies here, too. By December 26th or the day after the birthday or the day after the holiday or whatever, it's almost too late at that point. Godzilla has overtaken, and then you, uh, I think uh, Don on the voicemail said, that her house looks like Toys R Us. <laughs> I, I hope that it's not because there's like shopping carts everywhere, but she she has a lot of stuff there. And now the word that she mentioned, actually, she, she said something great. She said third party clutter. Yeah, I love. That. I love that term. It makes makes me want to write an essay about you know other people's clutter. And in this case, the other people are the kids. And, and she mentioned guilt, like the. Well, these things don't belong to her. Well, if they're your kids, technically, these things actually do belong to you. So that's the first thing to note, is they do actually belong to you. You know, I was at my uh, my uh, spine doctor's office recently, and uh, I was asking him, how was your Christmas? And he just sort of smiled. He looked at me and said, you know, I... I had a minimalist Christmas this year. And I'm thinking, wow, this is a, a spinal surgeon. And what do you mean you had a minimalist Christmas? And he goes, well, my daughters, I got them new beds for Christmas. And we had an impromptu packing party for my daughter's room. The, his two daughters are in a, a room together. For those of you who don't know what a packing party is, it's this crazy experiment Ryan did. You can Check out our TEDx talk if you want to learn more about that, theminimalists.com slash TEDx. I won't uh, bombard you with that entire story right now, but he did a miniature version, kind of what Ryan did. But the thing that he did that was so appealing to me, Ryan, is is he involved his kids in the process. So mm. they literally pulled everything out of the room because they had these two bunk beds yeah. in, in, in the room, and it was like crammed into there. And he bought them the, these... Uh, loft beds with desks underneath and for Christmas. And there were these beautiful things they really wanted, and, and uh, they're getting of age now. They're starting to use the desk. And in order to do that, in order to accommodate that, they completely had to rearrange the room. And it made it the perfect time to do an impromptu inventory of essentially everything they own. And, and the question that um, we have to ask ourselves, and I got this from our friend uh, Patrick Roan. We just finished interviewing him for the, the theatrical cut of our documentary, Minimalism, and he has a daughter and, and a wife, and uh, the question that he always asks is, is this where this belongs? Mm. You know, does this belong here? And it was interesting because I found that my doctor was doing the same thing with his two daughters, going through each item in the room and asking them, where does this belong? That's awesome. That makes me think of an attendee at our tour uh, during uh, our, our 100 city tour in 2014, God, it's like so long ago. <laughs> right. It was awesome though. It was a phenomenal year, 2014. It we was spent so cool. 10 months on the road, 119 uh, events in 100 cities, eight countries, and got to meet and hug just thousands, thousands of people. Thousands of yeah. people. Yeah. But it makes me think of one particular attendee who talked about what they did with their kid. It was kind of this one in, one out rule. And basically, they had a, a, a child who was in kindergarten or the first grade. They were doing a lot of uh, art projects, and they always wanted to display their art on the refrigerator. So it got to a point where 
the, the, the parent had to come up with something to uh, help teach this kid that, yeah, we can only put so many pictures on the refrigerator. So their child would come home and, you know, uh, would say, mom, mom, I've got this great art picture that I want to you know, put up on the, on the refrigerator. And then uh, the mom would say, great, let's go ahead and put one up on the, ref- go ahead and put it up on the refrigerator. Let's walk over there together and, and pick one to take down. So it was kind of this one in one out rule. Like, yeah, go, let's go ahead and uh, hang this picture that you really, really love. Uh, let's choose something to replace it. And then they would walk over to the trash together and they would throw that away. So I, I thought this was really cool for uh, a couple ideas, you know, First off, uh, you are teaching this this one in one out rule with a child, which is very very valuable. But then you're also teaching the child to not be uh, or, or to not attach or to assign sentimentality to objects. Which I know that there are many many people out there who who wish that they didn't uh, have so much sentimental uh, feelings toward towards objects. And this is a great way to kind of instill that into children from a very young age. Yeah, what we're really ba- basically doing there is is building this practice of letting go at a very young age. And yeah. you, can, you can tweeze out that uh, what that woman told you and, and apply it to all material things, not just the refrigerator magnets or, or, or whatever. You, you can have that apply to toys. Bringing new things mm-hmm. in means something else has to go out. And maybe uh, doing what my doctor did and taking an inventory after Christmas and saying, great, here's all the new stuff we're bringing into our lives. Are you really enjoying this? So in many cases, what I've found, especially with Ella, she loves playing with the boxes. The things came in more than she loves playing with the things. And, and so, you know, it, it, it's really about, well, what are the kids going to find value in? Mm-hmm. And, and I think that by making them question that and build the practice, you're not dictating. You're not saying, well, I'm... A, Simplify my life so you also have to simplify your life. You are now a baby minimalist. Which is the worst approach. I mean, who? if you came to me, Josh, and you were like, hey, Ryan, uh, you need to be a minimalist because you're a fat loser and you got a bunch of stuff and minimalism is going to fix you. Like, that would not Let's just have... say you were thinking that hypothetically. You wouldn't go <laughs> to someone and, and tell them that. Instead, what you would do is <laughs> is you would, you would try to exp- not even explain but but showcase the benefits. Now, here's the interesting thing. The benefits for me are going to be different for Ryan in terms of simplifying our lives, but they're going to be radically different for kids. Mm. You know, the, the initial benefit for me was like regaining control of my finances. Back in the corporate world, I had a you know, great corporate job and made well over six figures, but I had massive amounts of debt because I had no control of my finances. And so what I found is that I needed to regain control of my finances. That was a huge benefit of minimalism for me. Now, if I were to go to a a two-year-old or a five-year-old or a seven-year-old or a 15-year-old even and say, you know, if you get rid of a lot of your things and stop being so attached to material possessions, you can regain control of your finances. I know if I went to Ella, she would just like laugh at me like she does about, about <laughs> right. everything else, right? <laughs> what are finances? <laughs> right. And, and so what we have to do, if we're trying to expose simple living to other people, we really need to expose the benefits of simple living. Not the how-to piece, but the why-to piece. What's the purpose behind letting go of that which is in the way And what are the important things that we're actually going to be able to focus on? Mm -hmm. Keep in mind, we're letting go of excess because it's in the way. It's preventing us from living a more meaningful life. And that is true even with kids. Having a super abundance of toys that rarely get played with is not a, a benefit. It is a liability. And so, yes, you do need to set expectations with others about gift giving, but do it way before the holiday season. Because by the time November rolls around, people are saying, what am I going to get your kids for the holidays? By then, it's almost too late. You can still put a stop to it then, but Godzilla has already grown up. And so we need to quash that well before, and I mean, it's January. Now is a perfect time to start setting expectations with your loved ones. And by the way, if they're going to give you a gift, why not gift experiences? Kids love experiences, whether it's, you know, some sort of 
uh, Disney on Ice show or uh, this past Christmas, we just went out and chopped down a Christmas tree, a $5 Christmas tree permit. Mm. I mean, there are all these experiences you can do for kids that have nothing to do with an influx of crap, mm -hmm. as uh, Dawn on, on Twitter talks about. So that's really where I'd start. But I'd also say this. we got to let kids be kids. We have to remember that kids are kids. Mm -hmm. we, we interviewed um, Joshua Becker for our documentary, uh, he wrote a phenomenal book on this topic, so I'd certainly recommend it. It's called Clutter Free with Kids, and you can find a link to that, as well as a phenomenal uh, essay that Leo Babalta, so Leo and his wife Eva have six kids, and they are an entire minimalist family, and we interviewed them for our documentary as well. He wrote an essay called No Excuses, Minimalism with Six Kids. So you can find uh, links to that book, Clutter Free with Kids, and uh, that essay from Leo that uh, we had him write uh, over at theminimalists.com slash children. Yeah, there's, just a ton of, ton of resources. Yeah, there. there's a line from Becker's book that really resonates with me. He said, the rules of parents are but three, love, limit, and let them be. And he does a really good job of expounding on that. Uh, he gives really good tips and, and tricks on how to not again, tell your kids what to do, but to have your children asking the right questions. You know, another thing too, I think would help parents as well. Uh, and Stephen kind of uh, mentioned this a little bit in his voicemail where he talked about all of the information and the huge uh, amount of advertisements that we get. Um, you know, try to, going back to what Becker said, limit uh, what type of entertainment your kids are taking in, meaning that if you're letting them sit in front of the TV for eight to 10 hours, I don't know what the average kid uh, or how much TV the average kid watches these days. If it was anything like me, it was about six to eight hours a day. Um, you know, if they're sitting in front of that TV, they're getting uh, no doubt 5,000 uh, advertisements a day uh, from the TV and from everything else. So if you start to limit that, um, you can start to decrease the amount of advertisements and the, the things that are kind of planted into their heads. 5,000 advertisements a day, that, that's over a million a year. It's crazy. And, and it's amazing how we've changed. Uh, so I know Stephen really talked about there are all these things that kids think they need, they have to have. And, well, there's a reason for that. We spend... Well, we used to, say 1983, so about 30 years ago, we, we spent $100 million a year. That's a ton of money on advertising to children, $100 million to advertise to children. Well, today, we spend $17 billion advertising to children. I think you can look at, at it all, all over the place. The most pernicious example is uh, we, there are a lot of these games now that have in-game advertisements. Mm. And, and they're impulse buys, like literal impulse. You can click here to upgrade your game, spend 99 cents here, 2.99 there. And man, there are parents that are getting bills that are 40, 50 dollars, 100 dollars. I mean, there's some horror stories on the internet of thousand dollar phone bills because kids are, are, are bringing this into their lives without even knowing because they're acting on impulse. But guess what? That's not the kids' fault. Kids are kids, and they're going to act on impulse because they don't have the the frontal lobe to do otherwise. And and so we need to be careful what we expose them to. It doesn't mean we can completely filter out every single advertisement, but let's see what the children are watching and and act accordingly. I know with with Ella, like we, sh she's the only two and a half year old I know that essentially gets no screen time at all right now. Oh, wow. It's it's a big treat. We will sometimes on Sundays like break out Bex's iPad and let her watch a video, mm. and 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 so that becomes a big treat. But it's no it's not a pacifier. Now mm. here's the thing. That's really hard because yeah. it's really easy for me to break out, you know, my phone and say, "Yes, here, pacify yourself with this. Leave me alone. Leave me <laughs> alone, so I can go focus on something else and not really pay attention to the person who is right here in in front of me." And so I think we have to remember that kids are watching us, mm -hmm. and they're going to mimic what we do. They're going to act as if they are us, whether that starts with our words, the language we use. I know all the time um, 
Ella is so, so freaking curious about everything. She's constantly asking, why, why, why? And you can't just give her a, a, a simplistic answer. You can't just say, well, because that's how it is. Because now she'll just say, well, why because? Why because? And, and, and then you'll give her an answer, but five minutes later she asks the same question. And there are actually you know, psychological reasons uh, for doing that. Uh, kids really want affirmation and attention. But, but the, the reason that um, she's asking that is so we can try to reiterate the story in a different way and, mm-hmm. and explain it to her. But you can't just say, do you remember this thing I told you five minutes ago? Often we have to actually just reiterate the story. Mm-hmm. And so keep in mind that kids are watching us. They're they're paying attention. They're hanging on to our every word in, in, in many cases. And so we have to be careful with what options that we put in front of them, either intentionally or inadvertently. And you know what? I know you say you feel guilty, uh, Don, when you are getting rid of some of the stuff, but maybe the question to ask yourself is, what is my outcome? Like, mm. What do I want to get out of this? Because it's not just about getting rid of the toys. That would be really weird and sadistic if you're like, I really want to get rid of kids' toys. Well, no, that's not the point. Your point is you want to live with less clutter. And you want to not be bombarded with stuff that gets used once or twice or maybe three times if you're lucky and then discarded in in the, the junk bin in the closet or basement or attic or worse, a storage locker on the edge of town, you know, the outcome I think most of us want isn't getting rid of the stuff. The outcome is, well, I want my kids to live a happier or more productive life. I want my kids to live the good life and grow up to be good people, be responsible people. And I can tell you, you know this already, the material possessions aren't going to make the kid a better person. Right. I remember, um, you know, we, Ryan and I both grew up really poor uh, back in, on the outskirts of, of Dayton, Ohio, and we were discontented growing up, and, and I thought it was because we didn't make a whole lot of money, but, and we didn't have a lot of things, really. That's not why we were discontented. Uh, we didn't have pleasant experiences growing up all the time, and so... I can think back to some of the few pleasant experiences. For me, I, I had very few toys, but every other weekend uh, after my mom got her, her paycheck, she would take me to Big Bear. It was the, the, the store that was uh, you know, closest to us, and I would spend hours in the toy aisle trying to choose between G.I. Joe's and call it my decision down to the specific decision on, on one toy. And that was our, our form of, of entertainment. And it wasn't about the toy itself. I don't remember a single toy that we bought, but I remember dozens of those experiences and, and being forced into decision-making because we didn't have the money to buy five or six or ten toys. And being forced into that decision and making that a positive experience for me Mm. shaped my my life for the rest of my life. And I'm still able to do that now. And because of that decision-making process, repeatedly, I'm able to make great decisions with my life now. I have good decision-making capabilities. Yeah, it's amazing how the choices can even overwhelm a child. I remember living upstate New York where uh, it, it was me, my three cousins that my mom and dad had temporarily adopted uh, and then my mom and dad. So there were six of us uh, living in a one bedroom house. My mom and dad literally slept on uh, the pull out sofa. Uh, and when it got really, really cold, we would turn on kerosene heaters and like climb in bed with them, which by the way, the kerosene heater is like the most unhealthy way to heat your house. Uh, I don't think my Dangerous dad. Dangerous, <laughs> too. <laughs> yeah, I know. I don't think uh, my dad knew that at the time. Um, but I remember my grandfather sending my mom a check. Uh, to say, you know, thanks for taking care of my grandkids. Um, Here's a little bit of money to help you guys out. Take the kids to Toys R Us and let them pick out whatever toy they want. And I remember being so overwhelmed with all the choices that it literally got to a point where I was the last kid that hadn't picked out a toy. And my mom was like, pick something or we're leaving and you're getting nothing. So like I grabbed a bucket of Legos because they were there and it was something that, uh, that I thought I could get a lot of use out of. But, but sometimes when we think we're giving our uh, children, those 
those, uh, I say our children, like I have kids, which by the way, I, I understand how ironic this is that Josh and I are talking about kids. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because we used to get, we, we'd be out on tour like, like in, in 2014 or we did a 35 stops in, in 2015. Um, well, that seemed like a blip compared to the previous year. Right. Right. But we'd be out on the road and people say, um, you know, do you have any tips for, you know, minimalist parenting? And we just kind of look at them and say, uh, no. Not really. <laughs> uh, because it was like, hey, here's a couple of, at the time, 32-year-old single guys who didn't have kids. And it's easy for, you know, single uh, young guys without kids to, I say, I hesitate to say young there, right? <laughs> We're so, still young, man. Right, I'll take it. Uh, to give out... Advice, I mean, because, you know, we can give out draconian advice. Yeah, you just have to get rid of all of their stuff and force them to be minimalist. Yeah. But, of course, that's not what we think minimalism is about. We don't think there is a set template. There isn't a box that says, here are the, the, the hundred things that you have to own, and they have to fit into this size space in order for you to, to get your minimalism card. Mm-hmm. No, minimalism is different for different people. Mm-hmm. And, and it, it's going to be different based on your values, your personal desires, your personal needs. And your current living situation. And for people that have kids, that means that their living situation includes the kids. So mm-hmm. I think we have to set an example. We have to figure out what the outcome is uh, for the kids. Yeah. And you have to look at other role models who have done a phenomenal job. Well, I'll, I'll give you one other essay title here from our friend Leo uh, and his wife Eva. We, we had and they're the ones with the six kids, we had him write an essay for our website. Um, It's called A Simpler Family Life, Starting Life Anew with Our Six Kids. And you can find that, and he he gives some really great tips in there, at theminimalists.com slash Leo. I'm going to recommend one more essay um, because some people ask the question, uh, also, like, what about my partner? What if my partner, uh, how do I make them a minimalist? But we've got this. How do I, yeah, isn't it a weird question? Like, yeah. <laughs> how do I force this right. person to become a minimalist? Man, if we had that answer, we would write that book and charge way more for our books. Can I'm you help kidding. me brainwash my partner? <laughs> right. right. <clears throat> um, so I would like to recommend another essay. Uh, it's a t- it's an, The title of this essay is Minimalist Family, Start With Yourself. And you can find that at theminimalists.com forward slash family. Uh, But ultimately, that's what it talks about. It it talks about how this journey, it would be amazing to have every friend and family member become a minimalist. But at the end of the day, uh, you really need to start with yourself. Yeah. And at the bottom of that essay, there's another link to 12 other articles about about being a minimalist with a family. So I think you'll find a lot of value from that. Well, Don and Stephen and other Don from Twitter, we're going to send you each a autographed copy of Everything That Remains. It, it has a whole chapter in there about the different flavors of minimalism, and minimalist families are certain, certainly a, a flavor that is worth exploring. Uh, I'll leave it with this. You know, I think that it is much more difficult when you have kids, as I'm learning, to to be a minimalist. It's easier if you're by yourself. But if you have a partner or a spouse, if you have children, it becomes much more difficult. But it becomes so much more important at the same time. Amen. Well, we'd love to hear what you have to say. So if you have a comment about minimalist children um, or if you have minimalism tips about how you handle children, any tips that you might have, then give us a call, uh, 406-219-7839. I know some of you have got some really good tips out there. And I'll let and you know. some really bad tips, too. <laughs> We'd love to hear them both. But what I'll say is if you're scared, like I said this on uh, last episode, if you are scared to call in because you're worried that you're going to sound inarticulate on the air. I promise you we have a really good editor. No matter how much you ramble, uh, we will make you sound awesome on the air. But please call in and uh, give us your comments. Yeah, and we'll air our favorite comments and tips on the next episode. If we do select your voicemail, we'll send you an autographed copy of of one of our books, either um, Essential or Minimalism Live a Meaningful Life or my personal favorite, Everything That Remains. Here's some comments from our last episode. Hi, my name is Deb, and I'm calling. I want to say hello to you guys and also thank you. 
Minimalism has changed my life. Decluttering and only keeping what's essential and useful has made me a happier, calmer, more peaceful per- person. Uh, my son is 16, and he sees the positive impact that it brings. Thank you both for sharing this concept of a simpler lifestyle with us. Hey, guys, just wanted to say I really enjoy your podcast. I really enjoy the answer that you gave to Evan's question about cultivating passions. And so it really excited me, the idea of having a passion every 10 years, just as an example that you said. Hi, guys. This is Laura from Amsterdam. And, yes, I'm calling from Amsterdam, like from Holland to America, but I don't care. I work a telco company. (laughs) Still, I do, and I love my job. Uh, I'm a legal counsel, and I know you're not interested in what I do, but what I'm passionate about. But I actually really do love my job. Uh, I have comments on uh, the last podcast. It's what the, the girl was well, she was talking about. She likes trends and she wants to follow them. And what can she do without using like shopping apps? What for me it would be pretty easy because I'm like the same. You have three things like trend followers, trend setters, and trend, trend watchers. And actually, when you follow the shop, you're a trend follower. And, well, that means you're kind of late. So for her, it would be better to go just go out on the streets. And you don't have to be a trend setter. Just, well, be a trend watcher. Do it yourself and figure out what might be the next trend. And you will be good at it, at like, uh, well, maybe a month later or a year later. depends on if you're good at it or not, if you have a talent. Okay, let's move on to our iTunes comment of the week. Ryan. Yes, this comes from DJ80. This review is titled, Awesome. Awesome. (laughs) DJ80 writes, It's so refreshing. I never realized how bombarded with ads I was until I listened to this ad-free podcast. Well, we are really, really glad that you appreciate that. We want to make sure we add as much value as possible, and yeah, we don't want to sell you a bunch of crap. We just want you to... Have what you need. You know, it's interesting because I listen to a lot of podcasts, and I feel the same way. It's we used to. Okay, there isn't anything inherently wrong with advertisers. Sure, I think we we should we should just put that out there. They can be a bit dangerous, though. I mean, if you remember growing up in Ohio, we had some pretty terrible local advertisements. uh, La Rosa's Pizza, remember that? Yeah. Three, four, seven, one, 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 one. Big Tastes Bob, so Big good. Bob, Big Bob's. Remember Big Bob's carpet? <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, but here's the thing: like, I never felt compelled to uh, go to Big Bob's to to purchase carpet. Like, I didn't feel like this impulse to purchase immediately. Those are terrible commercials, and so they weren't very dangerous at the time. But advertisements now. Man, they're pretty slick. They're pretty good. So much sneakier. Advertisers do a great job. There are demographers who make $250,000 a year, $500,000 a year to aggregate your eyeballs and your eardrums to their advertisements. And they do a phenomenal, phenomenal job of it. And, you know, I think think that's dangerous. And so we have to be careful of of what we we put in in our lives. Advertisements are going to be there. Mm Mm-hmm. And, you know, we, we have to be able to deal with that. But at the same time, we didn't find it in line with our values to put advertisements on this podcast. So thank you all for those of you who do support our, our podcast. We really, really appreciate it. And um, uh, DJ, 80, we'll go ahead and send you a copy of one of our books. Uh, what book should we, should we send DJ for saying that we're awesome? <laughs> you know, my favorite's everything that remains as well. I mean, that's by far the best thing we've written. Yeah, let's let's send uh, let's send DJ a copy of everything that remains. And I just want to say thanks to everyone else who has left a uh, comment or review on iTunes. Our podcast has reached the top thirty of all podcasts, number two in its category. We really didn't expect this. Like, we we hope that over time, much like our website, it would grow and it would catch on, and more people would listen to it. But we didn't think that tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people at this point uh, would be listening to the podcast. And we're really grateful for you. So thank you for your reviews. Those reviews do help us reach more people. And um, we'll keep airing our favorites. We'll keep picking a iTunes comment of the week. So feel free to be really goofy or creative with your iTunes comments. I'd love to see some really crazy, goofy ones in, in the coming weeks. 
And Ryan, if you're feeling like it, I would love to do a true lightning round of uh, questions and answers. We'll do hashtag Ask the Minimalists on Twitter if you're open to that. Okay. If not, we can we can just not do it. No, let's do it. All I right. Was just, I was just thinking if I should plug in like all of our social media stuff right now. Like, hey, sure. I mean, if you if you want to if you want to contact us on social media, we we. We are on social media. We have uh, Facebook.com slash The Minimalists, and then Instagram and Twitter, we are at The Minimalists. And this first question from Fabio. Fabio says, hi, uh, hi guys. In your essays, <laughs> there is no date. How would it be possible to distinguish from old essays and new essays? Um, I would say you don't need to. The content is evergreen, and it is just as applicable today as it was five years ago when it was written. If we do need to put a date in something, we tend to. Otherwise, we we just don't have one. I like to think what we write is timeless. <laughs> uh, Dean Jones writes, hashtag ask the minimalist. Please include in the next podcast how to deal with keeping stuff just in case. Ooh, just in case. Well, if you haven't heard of our just in case rule, you can check that out on the minimalist's dot com slash j i c yes you know we think just in case are the three most dangerous words in the english language and so that essay is called letting go of just in case items we have a great rule called the 2020 rule we'll let you read all about it there at the minimalists.com justin asks hashtag ask the minimalist what advice do you have when it comes to buying a new clutter-free home Justin, I think if you're buying a home with clutter, that's probably a problem. I think any new home you purchase should be 100% clutter-free. Matt Taylor asks, hashtag ask the minimalist, how would you best declutter your life if your partner enjoys material possessions? Is there a compromise? Well, certainly there's a compromise, but you have to ask yourself that question, what is my outcome? And Ultimately, it's about showing your partner the benefits. Uh, Let's see here. Click writes, how can you minimize, I'm sorry, how can minimalism aid in the recovery from addictions? Hashtag ask the minimalists. Oh, man, that's a big one for me. You know, I, when I was addicted to uh, drugs and alcohol, it was because my life was so overwhelmed. I felt so overwhelmed and it was very, very stressful. And once I started to get the clutter out of the way, once I started to reprioritize uh, not only the things I was bringing to my life, but reprioritizing the people I hung out with really, really, really helped me to de-stress. And uh, it was a lot easier to get help. I'm not saying that it was an easy road. Uh, drug addiction t- t- of any sort, whether it's alcohol or, or, or heroin, uh, all addictions are very, very difficult to get over. I don't want to underplay that. Uh, but certainly cutting the superfluous things out of your life is going to help get through that a lot faster. At least it did for me. Yes, yes, indeed. Caitlin asks, at The Minimalist, I want to clean out most almost everything, but my man does not. He collects video games. Help! Hashtag ask The Minimalist. Minimize them. Get rid of, I'm just kidding. Don't do <laughs> well, that. <laughs> well, but here's what I'll say is you can't change the people around you, but you can change the people around you. Sure. Rewind that back and listen to it again and figure out what I just said. Caitlin, here's the thing. Does your partner have the same values as you and he just gets there a different way? Can you show him the benefits of minimalism? Surround does, yourself with people who have similar values. Yeah. Does he love you? Does he want you to be happy? I'm sure he does. And if that's the case, then at the very least, maybe he will support you on your journey. Maybe that doesn't mean he has to have a packing party or uh, that you're going to you know, judge all of the things that he has. Um, but you know, maybe take that approach and at least get, get some support. Daniel asks, hashtag ask the minimalist, when you do a packing party, what are the rules to books you have already read? My rule is I, I tend to get rid of them. The value is not in the book. The value is in the words themselves. Now, I, I tend to hold on to reference books that I am going to go back and reference constantly. Yeah, I was, was going to say that's the only books that I've held on to are reference books. Yeah, but if you want to read how I got rid of 2,000 books and started reading more, you can go to theminimalists.com slash reading. All right, let's do a few more here. Carrie McKay says, hashtag ask the minimalist. Great podcast. Please discuss whether a minimalist lifestyle is an over-controlled lifestyle. Where is the balance point? Wow. You know, I had someone come up to me at one of our events 
who said, do you find that minimalism is just a really good excuse for people with OCD? And, you know, what I'll say is this, is anything taken to the extreme is, is going to, uh, is going to be a bad thing. You can take minimalism to the extreme. You can take maximalism, uh, to the extreme. Minimalism, I think helps us find that balance, but, yeah, if you take it to the extreme uh, and, you, and you deprive yourself, then that, that's not necessarily a good thing, unless deprivation makes you happy. I don't know anyone who loves to be deprived, um, but if that's what it is that makes you happy, then go ahead and do that. But yeah, certainly anything can be taken to the extreme. Yeah, minimalism is not a radical lifestyle. It is a practical lifestyle. Abigail asks, how do you approach minimalism when your spouse has no interest in owning less? Well you find a way to approach it yourself. Start with yourself and show others the benefits. Yeah, I'm just going to give that link one more time, theminimalists.com forward slash family. It's an essay titled Minimalist Family. Start with yourself. Take a look at that. Okay, let's move on to our added value portion of the show. That's where we each recommend something that has added value to our lives. Now, I am going to recommend podcasts, which is kind of weird because this is a podcast. So you would think people listen to podcasts, but we've gotten so many messages on, on Facebook and, and, and Twitter and Instagram and elsewhere where people have said, you know, this is the first podcast I've ever listened to. And I think that's why the show is doing so well. We mm-hmm. have a lot of people who are listening who, have, who are avid podcast listeners like myself, and you have people who are relatively new to podcasts like you and, and, right. and sort of everything in between. And so we're, we're getting the best of both worlds here. So if you're starting with podcasts, you're finding some value in them, I'm going to just rattle off a bunch that add value to my life. The first one I'm going, going to mention is a podcast that I listen to for parenting advice because, you know, I'm, I'm still learning a whole lot. Um, it's called Mom and Dad Are Fighting, and it's uh, two folks – uh, from Slate, Dan Coyce and, and um, oh, I forget the gal's name. But um, it's an awesome podcast because they get to argue about different topics and they get to talk about their triumphs and, and their fails. Al- Allison Benedict is her name, uh, by the way. And uh, they get to talk about their triumphs and, and their fails and what they've done well and what they haven't done well. And they're fairly transparent about it. And they make recommendations I don't always agree with. Sometimes they seem crazy to me, but sometimes they're just these golden nuggets that I'm able to tweeze out and say, yes, that makes a lot of sense. I'm going to see if I can apply that to my own life. So check out Mom and Dad Are Fighting if you want some uh, some parenting advice. Now, I listen to a bunch of different podcasts, all kinds of podcasts. I rarely ever make it through most of them. If it doesn't sound great to me, if it doesn't feel like a masterpiece, I just move on. I've been doing a lot of physical therapy uh, lately for my back, and so I've had an opportunity to listen to hours and hours of podcasts while I'm doing that. So I'm going to just rattle off a, a few to you. If you want some of our favorites, you can go to theminimalists.com slash FP, which stands for Favorite Podcasts. And here are some that may not actually be on that list. So I have uh, Fresh Air with Terry Gross. Most of you probably know that radio show. I have uh, The New Yorker podcast, which is relatively new. They, they changed their format on it, but a bunch of pop culture stuff there. Uh, pop culture happy hour from NPR. Dan Savage. Uh, Dan is is the guy from whom we got the idea to take calls for our podcast. Now, just just a warning, He his is, he's a sort of a sex advice columnist. He gets a little raunchy on there sometimes. <laughs> yes, he can. But a lot of the advice he gives out, it's, it's some good pretty ad- great advice. Yeah, I mean, it's legitimate questions, too. It's not like he's just being raunchy for the sake of it. <laughs> yeah, and, and so uh, I really get a lot of value from his podcast. I, I really appreciate his candor and his honesty. Yeah. Uh, I listen to Neil deGrasse Tyson. He has a podcast called Star Talk. I listen to the TED Radio Hour TED Radio Hour sort of distills some of the best TED Talks and puts them on a weekly radio show slash podcast. Uh, The Very Bad Wizards, I talked about that on the the list, actually. Uh, WTF with Mark Maron, really, really great show. He has all kinds of different people on there. He had President Obama on his podcast. Now, he does this, this podcast from his garage, 
his house in the suburbs of L.A., and they had President Obama on there earlier this year, and wow. it was hilarious because they had snipers on the roof of the neighbor's house across the street, and they had to put like a whole tent bubble around his house. So he literally records these podcasts in his garage and um, has all kinds of big stars in there. It's one of the biggest podcasts in the world. Uh, 99% Invisible. It's a design show. It's phenomenal. Let's see if I can rattle off a few more here. Brett Easton Ellis, one of my favorite authors, has a great podcast. He interviews a bunch of different entertainers. This is actually was my introduction into podcasting. He was one of my favorite authors throughout my 20s and really inspired me to write fiction. And then he had this he launched a podcast. His very first guest was Kanye West, and he's had all kinds of people on there since then. Tom Sizemore and all kinds of uh, directors and, and movie stars, etc. The Brilliant Idiots love that show. It really lives up to their name. It's mostly idiocy all the time, but there are nuggets of just pure brilliance. It's all pop culture stuff, though. And uh, I think in an alternate world, we probably could call our website and our podcast <laughs> The Brilliant Idiots, because hopefully every once in a while, you'll get one nugget out of just one of these episodes. That's our gold. Our goal. <laughs> yeah. That, that's our goal and gold. <laughs> yes. Uh, Dan Carlin has two podcasts. One I recommend, won't recommend it on the favorite podcast essay on our website. It's called Hardcore History. He is basically the history professor you wish you always had. These are not podcasts. They are epic audiobook events. He'll do four, five-hour series on World War I. So he'll do like 20 hours on World War I. They're amazing. They are truly amazing. He also has a more political podcast called Common Sense with Dan Carlin. Joe Rogan, love his podcast. I don't know how he does it. He speaks for three hours at a time and does like four or five podcasts a week sometimes and just gets in there and talks and talks and talks and keeps it entertaining the whole time and has some pretty interesting guests on, on his podcast. Our friends Jessica and Melissa have a phenomenal podcast called The Mind Palace. They talk about what it means to live a well-curated life. They're both minimalists, uh, and they talk from other sides of the pond, so to speak. Uh, Jessica, who helps us out with some of our social media stuff on Facebook and Twitter, she does a phenomenal job there. Her and Melissa chat about mindfulness and living intentionally over at The Mind Palace. I'll leave it with these last four. They contrast each other a lot. So, Real Time with Bill Maher and Glenn Beck. I listen to those back-to-back. One guy from the far left, one guy from the far right, and it usually helps me articulate a point in the middle. If I'm able to agree with 20 or 30% of what Bill Maher is saying and 10 to 20% of what Glenn Beck is saying, I'm able to form my own opinions uh, about the news of the week and, and I find that it gives me a balanced approach when I listen to, to both sides. And then finally, our friends, Rob Bell and Sam Harris, both have podcasts. Rob Bell is a former pastor who talks about spirituality and religion and unconventional religion. But then our friend Sam Harris, who is a devout atheist and has written several books about atheism, has a podcast called Waking Up with Sam Harris, where he talks about spirituality without religion. And so I get to dip into both sides of the aisle there. We will try to do our best to put all of those podcasts in the show notes for this episode as well. I would recommend just picking a few, start out with them, see if you find value in them, and then move on from there. Yeah, um, my, my recommended uh, value add for today's podcast is right in line with... Uh, with you recommending podcasts. So I, I am new to podcasting. Um, when Josh came to me like six months ago, he's like, do you listen to podcasts? Cause I want to start doing podcasts. So, uh, he gave me a few recommendations. I started listening to them, uh, very quickly, uh, became uh, frustrated with the app that was on my phone. It wasn't a very intuitive app. Uh, so my, my recommendation for all of you is this app called overcast. It is a great app to keep all of your podcasts. Uh, it's very intuitive. And what I like about it is you can speed it up to one and a half times. So those podcasts that are super long, you can get, you can get through them a little bit quicker. Uh, it sounds you know, like they're talking really fast like this, but... Uh, but once uh, once you get used to it, um, it makes a huge difference. So yeah, overcast you don't have is to awesome, do that, right? But, but it's certainly an option, and I do that with, with longer podcasts and speed it up to one point two or one point five, and 
as I'm doing physical therapy in three hours worth of time, I can, I'm sorry, two hours worth of time, I can listen to three hours worth of podcasts, right. which, which is pretty amazing. I love Overcast. In fact, I uh, go out of my way to support them because it's a completely free app, but they give you a little donate option there. And so I try to donate. I think it's, uh, you, you can do the little subscriptions or whatever. It's like a dollar a month to donate to them. But it's a completely free podcast. But it is the most beautiful, most elegant, and most simple, easy-to-use podcast app that I have ever used. And I've used several at this point, and none come close to touching Overcast, that's for sure. Well, finally, let's move on to our last segment. It's what we call Right Here, Right Now. This is where we, we get to talk about what's going on in the lives of the minimalists. That's us. Yeah, man. We're going to Florida soon, right? Well, by the time this airs, actually, I am going to be on the sunny beaches of St. Petersburg, Florida. And uh, you all are welcome to join me. Maybe not on the beaches, although if you see me there, make sure you say hi. And I'd say get a hug, but that might be awkward for you Um, But if we're on the beach. But you know what? We're going to do three caffeinated days with the minimalists. Our friends, uh, Joshua Weaver and Sarah Weaver, this also married couple who are responsible for a lot of the photographs on our book covers and our website, uh, et cetera. Actually, the photograph uh, for the podcast is a photograph from Joshua Weaver. They are opening just an amazing coffee shop called Bandit Coffee Co., And we wanted to help them out in some way. We love coffee. It was our dream when we left the corporate world to just be baristas and then try to write part-time. And and I was really passionate about writing fiction in particular. And I just wanted to get by and pay the bills as being a barista. And the website kind of took off pretty quickly and didn't get the chance to, to go do that. And I'm really grateful for this beautiful accident of The Minimalist's. But now we get to go work in a coffee shop, at least for a few days. Living the dream, man. Amen. So we are spending three days in St. Petersburg, January 23rd through the 25th. We're screening the documentary, our documentary, Minimalism, a documentary about the important things. It's a special release, uh, charity screening for our documentary, where all the proceeds go to orphan care. We're we're building an orphanage in Honduras with our friends over at the Hope Effect. So if you are in Florida, or if you want to travel to Florida, I've already gotten messages from people in in Georgia and Alabama now saying, we're going to make the trip down to St. Petersburg. So uh, if you want to make the trip, we're going to be there for three days. Unfortunately, the December, I'm sorry, the January 23rd, event is sold out but so that's the screening of the film it was very limited in terms of tickets it sold out in like crazy 24 hours and before we even put it on our website it sold out we just tweeted it out but we're going to have 10 additional standing room only tickets the day this podcast airs and it's first come first serve it's standing room only but you'll have an opportunity to see this documentary months before it comes out in theaters Uh, later this summer. Uh, After that, though, on the 24th and 25th, completely free, we're going to be serving coffee to people. So we're going to be behind the counter working at the coffee shop at Bandit Coffee Co. You can find all the details about this event, including tickets, and you can RSVP to have us be your baristas there that day or those two days working at the shop. If you just go to theminimalists.com slash bandit, RSVP there. It's completely free, and 100% of the tips go to the orphanage we're building as well. If you can't make it there, you can still contribute to the orphanage till the end of this month at theminimalists.com slash hope. Cool. And uh, let's not forget about Tuesdays with the Minimalists on Periscope. We've been doing that. Uh, We started that a few weeks ago. It's been a lot of fun just kind of answering these uh, rapid fire questions on Periscope. Uh, We'll pull some stuff off of social media with uh, the hashtag Ask the Minimalist and answer some stuff there. But this is a really cool way for people to interact with us live. You know, it's funny when all these like social, me- these new social media platforms come out, I totally ignore them. And I remember when Periscope first came out, it came out like what, uh, a year ago? 
Uh, yeah, a little, little more a than a year ago. ago. Yeah. I just remember it coming out thinking, I'm never going to use this. I don't see the value in this. And then I started watching how other people were using it, like yeah. Colin Wright or uh, and any of the other you know people that we John Mayer out. was doing a phenomenal <clears throat> yeah. job with it for a while. He was he, doing guitar lessons with people. That it was is great. That is so cool. But that's what's cool about that that application is it allows you to interact in a live setting. Uh, it, it's kind of like video Twitter in a way, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, it's it's like live TV, but on the phone and it's not boring local live TV. It's whoever you want to follow. Right. And it's really neat. We've been doing this every Tuesday, 7 p.m. Eastern time throughout December and January. So you can still tune in. In fact, we'll be in Florida. So we might do some uh, beach time Periscope Tuesdays with The Minimalist. Feel free to join us. You can find all the details on that at theminimalists.com slash Tuesday. And one last thing, I have, uh, there's a writing class that I teach called How to Write Better, and I am doing a, instead of doing the, the full semester where you, you can take, I think it's 21 different video classes, a bunch of different coursework, I'm going to do a one-day, two-hour online class to show people the basics of how to write better and how to establish that habit and some basic tips and things I've learned over the years and help people learn from my mistakes. And that's going to be on February 7th at, I think it's around 3 p.m. Eastern time. You can find all the details uh, on this at howtowritebetter.org. We mentioned the documentary. Stay tuned. We're going to do a tour around the United States and Canada in May. I think we're doing something like 13, 14 cities at this point, and we're also going to, that's going to be before it comes out in theaters. So it comes out in theaters uh, May 24th, 2016, and before that, you're going to get a chance to meet us. We may even do some live podcasts on the road. In fact, I think when we're in uh, Florida later this month for three caffeinated days with The Minimalist, we'll try to do a live podcast uh, at our events there as well. But we'll hit the road in May. Stay tuned to our website and to the film's website, minimalismfilm.com, for details. And pretty soon, in February, we're going to tell you how you can bring minimalism, a documentary about the important things, to your city or your suburb. Yeah, I've seen a lot of uh, people comment like, oh, it's probably not going to come into my city. It's probably not going to come into my theater. And that is not true. It not can true at all. absolutely come to your city. Even if you're in, I don't know, give me a random city, Gary, Indiana. If you're in Gary, Indiana, you could you could still watch this film. Yes, if you're in Eaton, Ohio, bring it to Eaton, Ohio. Yeah. Chill a coffee, maybe. Details of gum. Yeah, absolutely. And And... What I said earlier, you can't change the people around you, but you can change the people around you. I can tell you I have surrounded myself these days with people who are supportive and caring, and we have different personalities, but we have similar values, and we even have different beliefs. And I think it's important for us to have people in our lives who we care about and allocate our time and resources to those people. And so we, whenever we're on the road, we have people ask us, like, It's great that you were here for a day and you had an event here. I see all these people here at your event, but how do we connect with open-minded people locally? And we never had an answer for a long time until we created something called Minimalist.org. It's free local meetup groups brought to you by The Minimalist. We don't want anything from you. We just wanted to create these meetup groups. So there's 100 cities in eight countries where we have groups meeting once a month, open-minded people, Give, your chance a, uh, give yourself a chance to surround yourself with people who are going to be supportive and, and caring and hold you accountable on whatever journey you're taking, whether that's a decluttering journey or you're trying to find your passion or your mission or you're looking to have better relationships, better health, a better career. You're looking for ways to grow. You're looking for ways to contribute beyond yourself. Well, this group can help you do that. Yeah, even if you're looking for some support With the 30-day minimalism game, that's what I really like seeing on these Facebook pages is uh, everyone supporting each other and, oh, look at what I got rid of today. Look, you know, look what I got rid of yesterday. Uh, Also, a lot of cool things going on uh, as far as like tiny home tours, uh, special guest speakers in different groups. So yeah, check out uh, minimalist.org community in your area and see if there's something there that piques your interest. Yeah, and if there isn't one in your area, don't worry, we've got you covered. There is an online city 
where we have hundreds, maybe even thousands of people who meet online at this point and help keep each other accountable online. And so you have both aspects here. If you have a local meetup group, your group can still interact with each other online. We have a, a Facebook group there where, where you can join, and it's absolutely free. All right, y'all. Well, we hope you certainly found value in this episode. And if you leave here with just one message, we hope it's this. Love people and use things, because the opposite never works. That's it for today's episode. Ryan, you, uh, you want to read the important bits for us? Sure thing. The Minimalist Podcast is produced by Sean Harding and is recorded at the office of Asymmetrical Press. Our theme music was written and performed by Peter Doran. For more of Peter's music, visit theminimalists.com slash Peter. This podcast is 100% advertisement free. So if you found value in this episode and you'd like to help us keep it that way. Because advertisements suck. Please visit theminimalists.com slash donate. Even if you just donate a dollar. We really, really appreciate it. If you have a question for The Minimalists, give us a call at 406-219-7839. If you'd like to read more from The Minimalists, you can subscribe to our essays for free via email at our website, theminimalists.com. Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll see you next time. Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing that's just feeding your greed Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it Every little thing that you gotta have Every little thing that you gotta have You gotta reach for and you gotta grab Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it So tear your eyes away Or tear